it's the, the receptor cells are resistant to. You're not giving them insulin, you're giving them you're giving them other drugs that have have properties that are working on the target sites, the target cells, and receptors, and sometimes working on how insulin stays in the body. Okay. And because uh, they're still making insulin. Yes. So people with type 2 are still making insulin. They just become sensitive and resistant to it. So there's a lot of different medications out there on the market um, for people who are type 2 diabetic. Those medications are not insulin. Okay. They're, they're targeting receptor sites. They're targeting the kidneys and how the kidneys filter because they're targeting insulin and how it stays in the system. But then type 2 diabetics can get to a point where all they've gone through all those medicines and it's still bad. So now they have, they're now even being treated with insulin, more insulin. But typically that's kind of a, a last resort because, you know, does that make sense? It does. And I have further questions now. Um, so the deeper insights that covered that, well, that was referring to type 1. Right, like where they're talking about that one. It's a big thing talking about how, um, what's his name? Oh, oh, yeah, that, that's for type one. That's for type one, the wasting okay. disease. Okay. Yes, for type one, the wasting. That was a death sentence back in the day. That was a death sentence. Yeah. And people got, you know, that was a wasting disease and a death sentence okay. before we so, were able to get insulin. Okay. That's why I said, you know, um, I almost feel like these two types of diabetes mellitus should almost be called something separate yeah. because they are so separate. And as far as like what causes them, yeah. the progression that would be, uh, be happening, and even treatment um, initiatives, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. It's probably like being called the insulin dependent versus non insulin dependent. Uh, yeah, you do. You do because it's, a, because, yeah. it's easier to. Yeah, because you understand it's a health professional, that's the uppermost thing on your mind. Yeah. Is thinking how are they going to process this insulin? Because who, what do patients die more from? The actual high chronic high or the insulin shock? The insulin shock. So we're not allowed to get insulin because it's a serious Okay, so so guys, thank y'all. I love that y'all are having so many questions about. I know, I do. Um, and I just encourage you guys to continue on. Um, all right, so where do we stop? Look, was it with white cells? Is anemia just one, a definitive diagnosis? No. no, absolutely it is not. It just means you have a low red blood cell count and or hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out why, right? Yep. Did we do blood typing? We did. Yes. And um, hey guys, you know, I hate to, I know y'all just finished a big test and stuff, but, but okay, here's what it is. No, no, <laughs> no, for Thursday. For Thursday, there's going to be a lecture quiz on this hematology stuff. So make sure that you understood blood typing. Go back and re-listen to lectures if you have to. Um, you know, do 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 what you need to do. Okay, get each other's notes. Um, talk with each other. Like I love these conversations I were I was hearing going on. These are great conversations. Um, so you know, just do what you have to do. But for Thursday, let's just say that that it's going to be a pretty comprehensive lecture quiz on, on everything we've done, hematology, up to the end of today. So that means, I, I, I know, I know, it's a lecture quiz, it's going to be pretty comprehensive. No hormones, though. Okay, look, so I'll, <laughs> so I'll give you a break on the hormones, but study the hematology, right? Yeah. Study the hematology between now and Thursday. 
and, and whatever we get to today, we might actually finish this and start into cardiology. So, so whatever we finish. So just because I know y'all have been concentrating on those hormones, but now go back to the beginning of the hematology chapter, really take a look because we're about to finish this hematology chapter. What's, uh, um, what's an antigen? An antigen is what is on the red blood cells to make it A or B. It, an at, when we think about antigens, they're proteins that can be found on the membrane as far as ABO blood type. It's, it, they're proteins that are found on those red blood cell membranes that you either get the information that you've inherited or you don't get it. You don't get the recipe, right? So uh, we said, if you remember from AMP1, we talked about this as a type of inheritance that can be co-dominant. So from one parent, when you think about homologs, chromosomes from your mom and a chromosome from your dad, from, what, from your mom, you might have gotten information for the A antigen. Is that right? But from your dad, you actually, from your dad, could you have actually gotten the same information from your dad? You could have, and you'd be homozygous for A, wouldn't you? Because you get two sets of information for these autosomal traits. Hopefully, y'all are remembering this terminology. Okay, but from your mom, if you got this, you're going to be A. But you could have gotten a recessive from your dad. You're still a blood type A, but you're holding a recessive. Is that right? Yes. All right. What about if you got from your dad information for the B antigen? You would be A, B, because this is a co-dominant type of situation where both recipes, one's not going to mask the other. You're just going to have them both. So we said we get that. For a person to be blood type O, though, what must their chromosomes have? What information do their chromosomes possess to be blood type O? The mom didn't give you any information, and the dad didn't give you any information. Your blood type O. So that means when you make an egg, you'll either send this one or this one for your man, your sperm, you'll either send this one or this one, but that's all you've got to give, right? Mm -hmm. This is why we said two people who are blood type O, maybe, remember the X means maybe, mm -hmm. can they have an A child? No, no. Because there's no recipe between them to give. Mm -hmm. Can they have a B child? No. Can they have an AB child? No. No, they can only have a what? an O child and these this person who is let's say this person who is a mates with somebody who is let's say this person is a B mates with somebody who's O can this can this mating can this mom who's a B mating with a man who's O can they have an a B child no, no. why not they only get one because she gets to only give one of these to the A and he gets to give one of his to the A. So this mating, they cannot have an AB child even though the mother is AB because she can only give one of those to her eggs and he gives the other. You get what I'm saying? So this is, if you remember, this is how this was inherited, uh, this particular typing. But we said we also think about um, the thing about cross-matching and when you hear about cross-matching matching issues and um, devastating things that can happen from incompatibility is because the packed cells are being given to a patient and the patient's plasma wasn't considered. Because what's in a patient's plasma? Antibodies. Potentially antibodies. A person who's blood type A has what type of naturally occurring antibodies? Mm -hmm. Antibodies against the B antigen. A person who's blood type B will have naturally occurring antibodies against what? A antigens. A person who is blood type O will have in their plasma what? A and B. They'll have antibodies against A and they'll have antibodies against the B. You. So a person who's AB, what will they have? No. They will have no antibodies in their plasma against A or B because they have the A antigens. And they wouldn't make an antibody against something that they have. Okay, now we said that we also think about this positive. When we think about positive, we're talking about the RH factor, which is a protein. It's also referred to as the what antigen? D, D. D antigen. 
If a person is positive, do you say inherited the D antigen on their red blood cell membranes? Is that right? Mm -hmm. So will they ever in their life make an antibody against the D antigen? No. No, because it's their self antigen. They're not going to make an antibody against it. But if a person is RH negative, if they got exposed to positive blood, D blood, could they make an antibody against it? Yes. And do we want them to do that? Mm -hmm. So if a person is RH factor negative, D antigen negative, do we ever expose them to positive blood? No. No. But a person who's positive, they can be exposed to, to positive or negative blood, can't they? Yes. Yes. Okay, so make sure you remember this. Go back through, listen, and remember. And one of the major concerns we have about that are women of childbearing age that are already factor negative. It's not a big deal, but we will need to know that they are. Because if they are, and they ever have potential that they're being exposed to foreign blood, which a fetus's blood is foreign, you would want to give them Rogam. Is that right? Because Rogam is going to seek out and mask any D antigen, so the mother's immune system won't know it's there, and the mother's immune system won't build antibodies against it. And that protects the subsequent potential exposures, right? And subsequent fetuses. All right, so we talked about white cells. Do y'all have, you know what, you know which white cells fight against which? Might y'all have to match that up Thursday? Mm -hmm. Neutrophils fight against? Mm -hmm. Lymphocytes fight against? Viruses and cancer, eosinophils um, produce histamines that we know are released in response to allergies and worms, parasites, right? Basophils, what? Basophils have histamine, but also heparin, and heparin is a what? A naturally occurring, naturally produced anticoagulant. What does the word coagulation mean? Blood clotting. Blood clotting. So if it's an anticoagulant, it means it's naturally occurring, um, not going to let your blood clot when you don't want it clotting. Now, some people call that thinning, but that's really a misnomer. It's really a misnomer about that because is blood really thinning? Is the viscosity changing in blood? No, it's not. So, it, you know, it's really kind of a misnomer there. All right, so great, y'all know, uh, right, or good, y'all stop me if we don't, if we're not good. All right, so we said, where do the stem cells that become all of our blood cells, where are they found? Red bone marrow. And depending on what hormones make it to the stem cell and knock on the door, if we're a stem cell, this room is a stem cell that is, um, that is in the bone marrow. We are stem cells, and we have receptors out here, don't we? Doorways, we have receptors. Depending on what not, is knocking on that door and what we let in, is going to dictate what we mature into. If a reefer poetin is knocking on this door and we let a reefer poetin in, we will, we will become a what? Red blood cell. Okay, if bravo poetin starts knocking on our door instead, though, gets there first, gets to us first, what will we become? Okay. We will become a platelet. And then we have these, they're called colony uh, stimulating factors, which are a group of hormones that tissues that are damaged will be putting out, depending on which gets to our receptors as a stem cell, will dictate whether we become eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils. What do monocytes do? Yeah, they're the big eaters. They become macrophages and they're going to eat, right? Um, right. I know some of y'all don't appreciate my theatrics, but anyway, it's just the way people are, and it's whatever. I hope that's all good. So anyway, so by what? A what? Is that a word? A yes. Okay. So all right, we know what the suffix penia versus cytosis means, don't we? Do we Penia yes. means low, and cytosis means high, right? So if we saw these terms, we would know what they meant. Uh, leukemia is going to be cancer of this white blood cell line, and it can be different types of leukemia. I was reading this morning in the uh, Richmond Times of a person had written in that had CMML, an older person, 
had this, an 81-year-old, and said, I don't know, I mean, I'd just like to meet this person. And they were sounded so positive, 81 years old, and I did not, but I'm in good health. I was thinking, that's a good attitude, and it's probably why, why they're in good health. But anyway, um, so when you think about leukemia, it can be of the um, monocytic line, which is, yes, both, monocytic, and myelogenous line. So it can actually, it usually hits one line. So if you ever hear like ALL, that's acute lymphocytic leukemia, or um, AML, what's acute myelogenous leukemia, depends on which line it hit, right? Does that, be, can that kind of dictate um, to us? Well, not always, because every individual is different, but do we kind of know prognosis based on the specific, right, you know, yeah. So what did that tell you in, in kids? In kids, would you rather have an acute type of leukemia or a chronic? Acute. Acute, it's acute actually better prognosis in children. But in adults, is it the opposite? You know, it's the opposite. So, uh, yeah, we kind of know that. All right, so uh, great. And then talking about the myeloid versus the, the lymphoid. And I won't even ask you that specific. Um, so today, y'all get, get to look at your blood films, don't you? Yeah? <laughs> so look at your blood films. They should look like this. <laughs> Not like this. I have some of these from UVA patients who have. <laughs> oh, but you have some of these here. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. I have some slides uh, from patients. But you all can see right away if this is what a normal blood film, but you did a drop of blood and you made a film, then you. If this is what you'd like to see, which is predominantly red cells, aren't they? Predominantly red cells, and every now and then a nucleated cell, which is a white cell, every now and then in the field of view. Uh, then obviously this is very different. Okay, so and these are blast. These are blast white cells. They're almost all nucleus, very dark cytoplasm with uh, nucleoli in the middle of them, and not a lot of functioning. And they're all being pushed out into the peripheral blood. Um, so, not good. Okay. Um, now, I want to talk to you about hemostasis. Please do not confuse this word with homeostasis. This, that's not this word. This word is hemostasis, which is going to be referring to the control of bleeding. Controlling bleeding. Okay, so hemostasis. So when you see this word, hemostasis, we already know that if somebody has excess bleeding, what do we call that? We call that hemorrhaging, don't we? That they're hemorrhaging, and certainly you would want to know how and why and where, you know, the rate. You would want to know that and hopefully stop it, right? So, but we have every day in our lives, we have occasions that we're bleeding. Every day. We really do. I don't care if you're bedridden for that day. <laughs> you still... You're going to blow your nose too hard if you're going to have some capillary bleeding. You know, usually it's nothing we see, though, is it? But, but hopefully you not have those bleeding. So you're doing things, you know. Uh, and you're going to have some. That's okay. I want you to know that these are the three steps of normal control of bleeding. And they are going to be a vascular, a vessel that's going to spasm. Then there's going to be a platelet plug that forms. And then there's going to actually be a blood clot, which is, I, I told you, is called what? Coagulation. Coagulation. Right? So there's three steps. Maybe this would actually really make good sense to you. Because, um, because when you think about this making good sense to you, um, let's see if I can get to a picture that I like on these new so-called better things with aren't. Okay, thanks for doing. All right, so let's let's think about this. You got this? Everybody good? Is everybody good? Yes. You've got this blood, these blood vessels, these capillary vessels, you know, and water vessels like veins and arteries. But you've got a, a, a vessel, and let's say a splinter entered into the vessel, right? So you've got this vessel and a splinter. Let's say you stepped on a nail or a splinter. Wouldn't it make sense that it would be nice if something could cause that to clamp up? Because just the spasming of it, would it close off the opening? Would that make sense that that would be a good thing? Now, I do want you to know that the platelets actually play a role in all three of those processes. But I, I want to just really, 
but but I really just want to show you first. I want you to think about. I want you to think about that that vessel. Is everybody picturing a, a vessel and the inner lining of a vessel? These inner linings, these vessels, have what are called endothelial uh, cells, tissue. And those endothelial cells are actually producing a prostacyclin, which is a, guess what that is? It's a hormone. But it's producing prostacyclin that repels platelets. So blood is moving through this vessel, isn't it? Blood is moving through. And the reason the platelets aren't sticking willy-nilly along the sides of the inner lining is because if the inner lining is healthy, they're producing this prostacyclins that are repelling platelets. And that's keeping blood moving, isn't it? But what happens when there's a breach in the vessel? When there's a breach in the vessel, then what's going to happen is, and this is because of something the platelets are secret secreting called serotonin. Have you ever heard of serotonin? Mm -hmm. In the central nervous system, it's doing something very different. But in your vascular system, if, if serotonin's there, it's going to cause the vessel to spasm. Now, wherever the breach was, the endothelium is not producing pr prostacyclins right there. So now what can stick there? The platelets can plug. So they're going to start plugging there. And I guess I'll go to that picture. Um, so now the platelets are going to start to plug because there had been a breach right here. So the platelets are going to plug. That's just the second step. Okay, that's just the second step. Now, and I really do hate this picture because it makes it look like uh, everything's blocked from this point, doesn't it? And that's not usually how it happens. It's usually like you're not going to block the vessel because if you block the vessel, then the tissue past this point can't get any blood supply, right? <coughs> but anyway, but now the third step, and this is going to be important for you guys to know, the third step, the coagulation step, is the actual step of, and this is actually an electron micrograph of the coagulation, which is like so cool. This third step, I want to tell you what's happening in coagulation. Ready? All right. The first step was a spasm, the vessel spasm. The second step is that platelets are going to plug where the, where the opening was because there's no longer prostacycline keeping it from plugging there. And the plug's going to happen. But it's really this third step that is your blood, that is the clot. And I want to, before you're writing a whole bunch of stuff down, I want you to know that uh, you can take a whole four credit class, science class on this slide, if you really wanted to. <laughs> all right, well, I'll tell you what I learned from it. It's just what's on that slide. It's all in a whole word. <laughs> 45 hours in that word. No, not really. This, this really does, is telling you everything you need to know. You guys remember that I told you that in blood, you have the liquid part of blood is called blood plasma. Then I did you guys say that? The extracellular fluid is called blood plasma. And in blood plasma, it's supposed to be water. But then there's all this good stuff. There's albumin, which is a protein from the liver, you know, that contributes a lot to the viscosity. But there's also nutrients and gases and hormones are being delivered, right? Is that right? Antibodies are in blood plasma. But then I also told you that there are blood clotting factors in blood plasma. I told you that if you remove the blood clotting factors, that, that fluid is now called what? Serum and serum. Do you remember me saying that? So now I'd like you to remember that I talked to you about blood clotting factors because here they are. Now, here's what I want you to know about them. You inherit the recipes for these proteins, these blood clotting factors. You inherit the recipes to make them. And they have been designated by Roman numerals. Everybody knows, learns Roman numerals in elementary school, right? So this is not Roman numeral what? And this is Roman numeral or y'all yeah, remember this is Roman numeral. Okay, so that's how th these are designated, these blood clotting proteins. And they are actually in blood plasma. They're there. And they're moving through blood plasma, just waiting to be activated. Waiting to be activated. Which step of blood clotting do they become activated in? Which step? The third step, coagulation. Remember? The first step was just a spasm. 
The second step where the platelets are sticking, kind of making a little flow. But here we go. Now, now we've got these blood clotting proteins that are going to become activated. I want you to notice that the first one is actually called fibrinogen. Fibrinogen. And I want you to notice that, that what we're trying to do in that third step, as, and I'm telling you the end before I tell you the story, but the in this third step, fibrinogen will become a fibrin clot. How cool is that? That we're going to convert this factor one, this fibrinogen, to a fibrin clot. And you guys, you know what? A platelet plug is awesome. A platelet plugs are awesome. There's no doubt about it that they're really awesome. But, but I'll tell you what, those platelet plugs are nothing compared to this woven clot that's going to end up happening. So getting from fibrinogen to a fibrin clot is really where we need to be. Okay? So here's what I need you to get from this. We, most of us, get these recipes to have these blood clotting factors. They're in our plasma. They're circulating around. They're going to be there when we need them. And when we need them, it's going to be rather quickly that we can get from fibrinogen to a fibrin clot because we have all of these in place. And all they have to do is become activated, get a signal, just a signal. So there's two pathways, and you do not need to know, intrinsic and extrinsic. They both have different kind of timing sequences. But what they truly are is these factors, and you can see like that's 11, and you see that. These factors are going to be like dominoes, and they're going to have this kind of cascade event that happens. One is going to become activated that ends up pushing the other to do what it needs to do, pushing, 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 until we get stimulation for fibrinogen to become a fibrin clot. You'll notice along the way that what is needed for these to happen. But wait a minute, we already knew that. We said the reason calcium can take you out of this world today is that what were the three reasons calcium needs to be in homeostasis? Because it can take you out of this world today with perfectly healthy teeth and bones and gasket tonight, right? But, like I said, sorry for the theatrics, but this is really true. I told you because of nerve communication, muscle contraction, and what? Blood clotting. Proper blood clotting. And now we see that in this cascade domino effect, we really do have calcium needed for this, right? All right. So, so what I'm getting you to, what I'm wanting you to know is that each of these factors need to be present, and they need to be present in the right amounts, and they need to work when we want them to work. What would happen if I took somebody and I took one of the factors out of their system, removed it because they didn't inherit the recipe for it? Now, when they need to go from fibrinogen to fibrin, can they get there as fast? Can they maybe even get there at all? Uh, maybe not. Does anybody know the disorder where you are lacking one or more of a clotting factor? What you say? Hemophilia. Hemophilia. The per do what? Your your aunt had hemophilia. So so. Um, she okay? No, she died. She, but, but did she die from that, or did she die from something? Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. The, the predominant type of hemophilia is lacking factor eight. That's the predominant. 80 plus percent of hemophiliacs lack factor eight. It's usually a male disorder. Why? Because where do you think the recipe is? On that 23rd pair of chromosomes, right? And why do males have more sex linked disorders than females? They only have one X that they got from their mom, right? That they didn't get the information for it. So hemophiliacs. But, as Ashley has shared with us, um, again, the triangles, women can have hemophilia as well, and they can even have, you know, it's just less common to have you know, uh, this factor A deficiency, which is the, one of the most deadly. But women can have von Willebrand's, which is factor um, 10 deficiency, and some of the other deficiencies as well. And sometimes women don't know until like they are pregnant or they have had surgery. Sometimes soldiers, even males and females, don't know until they've had a sort of catastrophic injury 
and they can't stop the bleeding, right? And then they find out that they have one of these factor deficiencies. So where do we get our factors from? Our parents give us information to make them, do we need them all in place? Yes. When uh, we have a bleeding event, do we want the cascades to happen? Yes. And do we want them to happen in the timing sequence that they should happen? Yes. Yeah, when you all have done any sort of blood work, like my, my people here, my nurses do, y'all have drawn little blue top tubes. Those little blue top tubes, you are looking at prothrombin and thrombin times, PT and PTT times is what you're looking at and you're seeing how that person clots. Sometimes they're clotting too fast. And do you have to, what are you gonna give them if they are? A type of heparin. And warfarin is one of those that so you're giving, you're gonna slow it down a little bit. But sometimes they're not clotting fast enough. And is that a problem too? Yeah. So you guys, what is this step? What step is this? Triangulation. Triangulation. What must you have all in place for it to work properly? Yeah. Blood clotting factors. If you're deficient in any, it's called? Hemophilia, the most common type is lack of factor what? Eight. Eight, but there are many, there are some other factors too that might not be as common. How many factors are there? Uh, well, when you're looking at this, and I think they're all located on here, it's gonna be at least 12. Um, so yeah, but actually there are a couple, a couple of others, but anyway, that's, that's the majority of them. So hemophilia is when you lack any of the one factors and then the eight is the most common. Yeah. So hemophilia is just, uh, it, it not just, it's, well, serious. it's a blood clotting disorder where you are lacking, um, one or more of the blood clotting factors. The most common is hemophilia A. Hemophilia A is when you're lacking blood clotting factor eight. Okay. And it does have a significant mortality rate associated with that without getting those factors replaced. It used to be that the only way to get those factors replaced, well, it used to be back in the day you didn't get out of childhood because you ended up dying from sub toes and stuff. You would bleed out. But then y'all have all heard that the royal families, that the European royal families had these sort of incestuous types of uh, relationships you know they were married and so they had these higher incidences of these disorders in their family lines because they were keeping them in their family lines by marrying cousins and you know whatever royalty right um so you understand why that disorders if there's there's that sort of incestuous thing why they are higher in those populations I'm not giving any kind of criticism of that. I'm just saying, you know, it, genetics, we see why that happens. But if you were in the royal lineage and you had hemophilia, you could have like little stewards protecting your baby, your, your kids growing up, Don't, not letting them get hurt, right? So they could live longer and then they could procreate and they keep it in the line, you know what I mean? But, but most farmers didn't have that happening, so their kids, were not getting treated like they were in bubbles, were they? And so they were more likely to die from um, from blood clotting disorders. All right. Um, what do we give now to? Oh, to thank you. <laughs> so, so that was back in the day. But then uh, it was early in the 1900s we were able to. Uh, when I say purify, I'm using that sort of liberally. We were able through human donors to get factor, these factors out fairly early, but it was human donors that were giving um, these blood clotting factors to hemophiliacs. So in the early, late 70s, early 80s, what were our hemophiliacs in, in developed countries dying from? Um, this is in the 80s, guys. Uh, cross ocean blood cell? No, not having access to it. I'm thinking AIDS, something like AIDS. It was HIV positive. Oh. They were dying from AIDS. So little kids dying from AIDS, and I say little kids because they were you know, getting the um, factors in the, from human donors, and we had a lot of that. If you go back and look at our history of this country, we had people burning their neighbors' houses down because their child had AIDS. Their ch children next door were HIV positive that were hemophiliacs. What is that? Other than a crying chain. What was that done? No, so, so that, that, that happened. Y'all looked that up. People were doing that. 
at the University of Virginia, we had in the early 80s a pair of triplets, Candace, I, I used to know, I actually worked with these little girls. It was a physician's triplet daughters who had, um, when they were born, they had it, because obviously little bitty preemies can't get a whole unit of blood, can they? So what would they do? They would give split units, and they would give, because you can't overwhelm somebody's system, system of fluids. So they split a unit of blood with these three preemie little identical girls, and it was a positive unit. Mm -hmm. So these little girls, um, I was there when two of them had already died from AIDS, and one of them was still alive when I left, but they didn't expect it to make it much longer. They got too older. But these little girls were so discriminated against that they couldn't tell like daycare or schools, even in a pretty, you know, not, not all areas are as educated as so on, but even in an area that was pretty much, you know, informed, it was still so feared. Hard to think about that, isn't it? Because now we know that's just really through lack of education that people are so prejudiced and biased, aren't they? It's just a lack of education. But people were really afraid in this country when um, HIV and AIDS started, you know, first appearing on the horizon. So, so in the 80s, we lost most of our hemophiliacs because of advanced HIV progression to AIDS. But it, then it was also in the 80s, the late 80s, that we were able to start through genetic engineering, getting microorganisms to make human blood clotting factors. So we were able to take that component out of it so that people who needed blood clotting factors weren't and, and insulin, <coughs> same thing with insulin, and insulin and these other products that we had required human donors to give, we were now able to give these medications that were completely safe because of genetic recombinant DNA technology. Isn't that awesome? It is really awesome, and that's advances, you know, so we kind of forget, I think a lot of people, because most of you weren't, weren't born in the 80s, were you? So, you know, you're thinking, really, that's like ancient history ago, but it really isn't, so it's a whole completely, you know, I think sometimes people can be negative and think how awful human situation is now, it's not, it's so much better than it was even in the 80s, you know, we, we've really come a long, long, long way in a very short period of time in medicine. Um, and it's usually lack of, uh, to keep things going forward is usually because you're fighting systems, you know, because of lack of information and fear. Fear can really hold up the process, right? So you try to shine light on fear and then it doesn't, uh, doesn't scare too, you know, people too much. If you just shine a little light, shine a little light. Um, so anyway, any questions for me? So the donors, was it not a, a good test to see that they had the AIDS? Oh, oh, back, back in the 80s? Oh my gosh, we didn't even have a test. Okay. We didn't even have blood tests to test the donors. Because of that, because of the, and it set precedent for the entire country that the little girls that were born that had the split unit between them, when they were discovered to then have gotten HIV from that unit, uh, the entire country, the medical com com community, realized that multiple births, so twins or triplets or whatever, were never more, it's not allowed to split one unit among them. You have to use different donors just for that reason, because you wouldn't want to have even that risk. But in the early 80s, we can have blood tests to test for the donors. Just yes, and people, and, and well, well, we had some testing, but we didn't even know for sure what the etiology of this, this new disease was that we were seeing. We didn't know what the etiology was. And uh, I remember when it was discovered, and it was amazing. And then, we, then after it was discovered, the etiology, this virus that ended up devastating people's immune systems. Then we were able to then uh, create some testing for it, but it took a while. Now listen, now blood products, blood products are tested for all that, and are they much safer now for that reason? Are they completely safe without any risk? No, but they are much safer than they were then. And then we didn't have any other way to give somebody insulin or factor, any of these factors. The only way we had were human donations where people would come in and through plasmapheresis, meaning not just giving a unit of blood, 
but they would have blood being removed, their plasma being taken out, and their red, their blood cells being put back in, where they could give a whole lot more plasma that way. Has anybody ever done plasma phoresis donated? It's a, it's a great thing to do if you ever have an opportunity to do and you feel good about it. Anyway, um, so they would give platelets that way. You can give a lot more platelets if you're doing plasma phoresis. You can give a lot more of those clotting factors if you're doing that. So they were doing that because it was the only way to treat. So, um, but at the same time, advancements were happening in recombinant DNA technology and genetic engineering. So now we have microorganisms that are like little workers for us. And all we have to do is feed them. <laughs> feed them and they're making human insulin. They're making human blood clotting factors, human factors. And do, we just purify the kill them. So it made the cost come down way more efficient, you know, and less, and, no, and you know, the risks go down. All right. Well, that was a lot more than you wanted to know about this. But, <laughs> um, but did, I, did anybody ask some question that I forgot to answer? I know that happens. All right. So when we think about the blood clot, and I kind of want you to see, um, I don't know where the pictures are. When we think about that blood clot happening, we say we get this idea that, that's why I don't like this picture, but we get the idea that this can continue to grow. So while the three steps are happening, you're in a positive feedback until it happens. But then it has to stop. That positive feedback needs to be cut off. And when we think about that stopping, it makes sense that it needs to stop because if it continued to grow, you would end up having a clot that was blocking what? Like this one looks like it's a blocking the vessel. And then the tissues past that point, can they get oxygen? Can they get nutrients? And can they get rid of waste? No. So it has to stop, and we actually, it is gonna stop because we have um, already, as soon as the clot is starting to form, it's already starting to retract. Um, and there are these products called fibrin and lysin. What does lysis mean? Lysis is to what? Lysis is to split, right? So uh, there's already a, clot, a process where the blood clot is already starting to dissolve and be maintained and managed. Is it what it we call a blood clot in an unbroken vessel? Do we know what a blood clot in an unbroken? See, there should never be a blood clot in an unbroken vessel. We know if the vessel's broken, we need to spasm, plug, and coagulate, right? But if it's not, it's called a thrombosis, a thrombosis right? So a thrombosis is a blood clot in an unbroken vessel. Do you know what you call that when it starts to move, when that blood clot might move? It's called an embolism, an embolism. So a thrombosis is a blood clot in an unbroken vessel, and that is not good news, guys. Where we hear of them are in the deep veins, and they're called DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, right? DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, not a good thing. It's usually going to cause pain in that area, wherever the DVT is, it's going to cause pain. It can cause swelling because fluid is getting into the tissues, but you, there's no return fluid happening. So it can cause swelling and pain. You don't want to rub that site. Why not? Because you could dislodge the clot. And if that clot starts to move, it's now called an embolism, which is deadly. Embolisms, if they move to the lungs or the heart, it can be instant death. Pulmonary embolism is one in the, in the lungs, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If it goes to the heart, it can, again, can cause a major cardiac event, a myocardial infarction, which is what we call a what? A heart attack. And they really can lead to instant death. So a thrombosis, make sure you understand, is a blood clot in an unbroken vessel. An embolism is a moving thrombosis. And what's the risk? It will get to the what? It will get to the lungs or the heart. And if you've ever known anybody who, su who survived pulmonary embolism or an embolism period, and I, they are a very, very lucky person. A very lucky person. Yes. I'm saying first. Can it go into the column or goes to the heart? Or uh, well, usually to... what's going to happen when it gets here, it's going to end up causing a cerebral vascular accident, which we call what? Stroke. We call it a stroke. 
across Australia. Yeah, thank you. Good question. So it can bypass your lungs and your Yeah, body. yeah, and it can actually be, and we call that a stroke, a cerebral vascular accident. Does it discriminate against which one it goes to? Well, it just depends on sometimes luck, but also <laughs> where it forms, right? So okay. what, what do they say is one of the best things you can do to prevent that? You can't yeah. move or just move, right? Yeah. Or just move. You know what they, you know, y'all are hearing and it really makes me mad. I like to sit down when I get on it. <laughs> but guess, are you hearing that the sitting is the new what? It's like new dust. Dust. The new smoking. So sit in our society now, sitting is the new smoking as far as how. And that really makes me mad because no, it isn't. Because, um, <laughs> so and because guess what? My husband smokes. Okay? So when he comes in from outside smoking, he sees me sitting, he's like, don't talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're sitting. I'm not talking about you're sitting. So, um, anyway, y'all don't care about this. But, uh, okay. but actually, <laughs> is it unhealthy to be sitting a lot? It is. And so, that's what you need to be doing. But now they have those, um, you know, people who do desk work, they have the standing things. Does anybody use that? Someone has a sleep thing. Oh, oh, God. Okay, that's kind of what I need at night. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> just like a little thing about you can just let go. Yeah. Yeah, and sitting on like those balls because you know you have to be paying attention. What you said, they need to have more time. Oh, can you imagine the play with the balls? I heard it. We are focus for the first few weeks. That'd be awesome. But then they have little kids running around the ball and bumping into each other. Yeah, they can throw in balls on it. Hey, but I'm all about little kids moving while they're learning anyway. With no one. We have to sit here, but I think that's actually not bad. All right, so anyway, probably. So these clots have to be controlled, okay? So, and I, this is the hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and you know, others. So there's others. What's a hematoma? We have learned this. A bruise. bruise or anything. Yeah, so, well, well, it's just a bruise, period. But actually, it's just a bruise. So, but when we think about bruises and their hematomas, we understand that you're having bleeding out of the vessels into the tissue spaces. Sometimes they're really apparent, aren't they? So you can see through and see where the bruise is. But think about this, you have a set amount of blood volume, and if you've lost any into the tissue spaces, you know, can that essentially affect your blood volume? Yes. And actually, can it be so deep that you not always see, no. see it? Yeah, so, so do, do know for like the patients who've had surgeries, or patients who come in with trauma, you'll have patients who come in with trauma and you're not really sick, they're telling you something's really aching and you're like maybe palpating a site and it's hard. It's like a hard site and whatever and, and you can see some swelling in it. Are you a little bit worried about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it can take a long time for some of them to actually be reabsorbed and, mm -hmm. and dissolved and sometimes they don't. So what do you have to end up doing? Mm -hmm. We have to end up going in there and actually removing some of it sometimes. Sometimes we really do. But hematomas, yeah. All right, so um, so guys, you know how you hear about people who, um, you hear about people who are taking aspirin and that's a blood thinner, you know? It's, and I think that's what people, vision, that's what they envision that it's doing that. But what it's really doing is actually interfering with one of the blood, at this blood clotting cascade, right? by interfering with one of these um, coenzymes. But same thing, like when we think about um, like vitamin K is required, we have bacteria in our colons. Y'all know about E. coli, Escherichia coli? That's in our colons, it's helping us to get some of these vitamins that are necessary for these types of components that are, gonna help, that are going to uh, help with this. But we know there's some things that can interfere with vitamin K, and so these are how, they, this is how these thins the blood, but is blood really thinning? No, it's just that this cascade coagulation event is actually uh, being affected. So, what? Okay, so I, I, I need to tell you about something that I don't know, that, that it's not in, your, in these notes, or maybe I just skipped it and I wanted to, so, uh, I want to know. I want you to know that you can have not enough blood body, right? And you can hemorrhage, but you can also have too much blood clotting, unwanted blood body, 
And um, a very serious event that can happen. Has anybody ever heard of DIC? I thought I included this in your notes. But anyway, has anybody ever heard of DIC? I could have sworn I put this in your notes. It's in the disorders. Okay, good. So DIC, DIC stands for disseminated intravascular coagulation. Disseminated means what? What does disseminated mean? If I disseminate quarters in this room, or, or Hershey Kisses, what did that just do? I disseminated Hershey Kisses throughout the room, or spread it out. Throughout the whole room, I spread out Hershey Kisses, which I'll make that happen. But anyway, disseminated intravascular, in, inside vessels, coagulating, is when all of a sudden in the body, these, these coagulation cascading events are happening throughout the body, and it's happening quickly. Y'all are talking about seconds. Seconds. Now, does that even sound like that could be a good thing? Okay. When you have, has anybody ever heard of this? Um, if you work in, in internal medicine any length of time, you'll have a patient that dies from this. And by the way, most die from this when it starts because it happens that quickly. So, what will happen is you will have your patient there and they're going to start for whatever reasons, and a lot of the reasons are unknown. We know some things that can cause it, and so we watch for it. Uh, a change in blood volume happening too quickly, changes in blood volume happening too quickly. So your heart's pumping blood around, right? Your blood has to be moving, doesn't it? If blood slows down moving, what will they start to form? Clots, right? So if you've had this, this crazy kind of changes that are happening too quickly, Infections, certain infections can, can lead to DIC events. Infectious diseases can, certain ones. But it's, it, luckily, it's a pretty rare event. And it can be stopped if it's caught quickly and if you're incredibly aggressive in the treatment. But what's going to happen typically is in the, in the extremities, these vessels are going to start to shut down. So you're going to see someone turning uh, blue, black, dark, dark. From the extremities, and you can watch it happening. I saw it happen on a six month old one time. Yeah. No, it was really horrible. It was really horrible. And um, this six month old ended up having it was stopped. So we were able to stop it. I had no idea then, didn't think later it was Kawasaki syndrome, but why it was happening at the time. This little six month old, it stopped, but by that time, she had already lost circulation from her feet with one hand, so she lost both feet in one hand. Mm. Uh, there was no bringing that back. Some men meningococcal diseases, like my serum meningitis is one, it's a bacteria that can really do this, where you'll get these petechial rashes, and then all of a sudden go into a DIC event from another patient that I was involved with in infectious disease was an 18 year old. Uh, young girl who lost all four appendages mm -hmm. when the DIC event happened. And that's not uncommon for, for people who have Neisseria meningitis as the cause of their meningitis, is to lose appendages because of DIC events. So, luckily, it's rare, never something you kind of want to hear about that you should know about disseminated intravascular coagulation. So, the blood vessels are straight. They start throwing clots. They're throwing clots, and then the tissues past that point can't get any blood supply. They're cut off from blood supply. And you're actually seeing them. I'm oh, sorry, not it. You're watching it. I'm talking about minutes. Minutes. So, is this what happens when you get the wrong blood type? Well, when you get the wrong blood type, and this is happening, that's typically happening at a much smaller uh, area but serious areas because it's your organs. It's not your extremities. It is happening in your extremities, but not enough to visually see, but it's happening in like your kidneys. So your kidneys shut down and or your lungs shut down. So now the person is either gonna have to go on a bypass thing uh, and certainly dialysis until they can maybe get new, right? Or they're just not gonna make it. But yeah, it's kind of something. Um, but instead of just the red cells clumping, these are actually coagulation. These are blood clotting factors making coag, like the clots happen. So too much. Now you can give for people who have had an embolism, get to their heart, they have a heart attack, 
or people who've had stroke. You can get things to break it up, those clots up. This is a, an <laughs> enzyme that's made from streptococcal bacteria. So you usually think about streptococcus bacteria as causing disease, right? But we can, it actually produces a product that we can use in medicine because this lysis clots. Now, somebody has to know what they're doing when they give this. You have to give it in a timely event because this or the TPA. T TPA, if y'all want to know, stands for tissue plasminogen activator. Um, you can imagine that these are, these are pretty serious. So you can give these, but that can also lead to like bleeding out, can it? So when somebody gives this, they know it's a last resort kind of thing and they have to know what they're doing. Okay. Uh, leeches are definitely used. So I think it was Nicole asked me, are leeches still being used? Yes, of course they are. Now we do have mechanical, some places have mechanical leeches. So there's, um, that was actually, engineers at UVA came up with a patent for the little mechanical leeches. And they're probably so mad because guess what people still want to use instead? Leeches. Real ones. And so uh, in some, it, some situations when you want to keep blood coming to the site, then you need to, leeches are perfect to do that because you can keep blood coming to the site because they secrete this anticoagulation, anticoagulant that's causing blood to continue to flow to that site. They're pulling blood to the site. That's a great thing to do, right? Um, maggots are used. So maggots that they, you know, they irradiated them. So supposedly, you know, whatever. But maggots are awesome because what do they feed on only? Dead, dead, dead tissue. So if you need to debreed an area or need to get rid of a lot of tissue debris, and maggots are right to use. Is that because they're not going to hurt the they're not going to hurt the healthy tissue. They're just going to get all the stuff out of the way, uh, so the healthy tissue can then breathe and start the healing process. Is that used with burn victims? I I haven't seen it with burn victims used, but it can be used with abscesses, like when there's like um, abscess wounds. Now burn victims can have abscess wounds, but they're dealing with so, many, so much other stuff that no, I haven't. I've never seen that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yeah. Would the magnet be like a more, would be a less invasive? And you Much less invasive it. than you cutting. Because when you are cutting away dead tissue and abscess, you, and they, I mean, obviously we're using, well, not me, I've never done this, but people who do this are using, um, you know, it's health enhancing. But usually when you're cutting, you're cutting into the healthy tissue. But the maggots don't touch the healthy tissue. They only take it to the margin of the dead. So it would take a while, but yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. so exactly. And some people, uh, some people won't, don't want to use those types of things. I can see. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so how do y'all feel about hematology? Do you know more about blood than you did? Yeah. I mean, that's the goal is that we're learning. So, uh, okay, um, do y'all want another five minute break before we do start discussing the heart? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's do a little five minute break, okay? And then we are gonna do a little bit of the heart and then we'll come back and get to let, uh, we'll do the lab after that. So five minutes, jump up and down. Remember, remember what sitting is, right? What is the invasive treatment for the DIC? It's anticoagulant. It's going to be anticoagulants. They're given. They're given massive amounts to try to stop those clots, break up those clots. Okay. So this is what they're doing. They're trying to do that quickly. She was, and she's got a lot of walking. She's so sweet, and she's so nice, and she got to smile for kids. I hope they get some nice because. We know about the blood, we know some things about blood, right? Mm -hmm. And we know it's this liquid connective tissue that all of our other tissues depend on mm -hmm. to deliver nutrients, to deliver hormones, to pick up waste products, and take them back to the body. So we know the blood does all these amazing things. Please know about thirsty. The function of each of the cells, the function of blood, and also kind of what plasma is. So anything like that we talked about the Thursday. Are we going to need to know like the percentages? Right? Huh? Are we going to need to know the percentages on Thursday? Uh, just if I've given you. Yeah, yeah. So I gave you some basics, then not here. Yes. Anything we talked about. All right. So now, how is that blood getting around? How is that blood getting around to all these like 
the ends of your fingertips and the ends of your toes and up here to the hair follicles. How is that blood being moved through the system? Blood is being moved through the system. By this, this heart. Do y'all think the heart's a pump? Who would say the heart's a pump? Raise your hands if you think the heart is pumping blood around. It's a pump. Is the heart a pump? Some of you are not playing. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> All right. The heart isn't a pump. See that picky. Uh, the heart isn't a pump. You've got to hear what I'm about to say, or you will never really understand how blood moves through the system. So just listen. Instead of trying to write this, listen to me for a second. The heart is not a pump. The heart is two pumps that just happen to be working in perfect synchrony. If you don't understand that, you will never understand blood circulation. But you would also never be able to understand the heart. So let me say that again. Your blood is being pumped around in a closed vessel vascular system. Can blood ever slow down? Because if you just told me if blood slows down too much, what is there going to be a risk of? Um, throwing clots. So blood has to keep moving through this closed vascular system. And it's actually two pumps that are keeping it going. Is that what you're saying? Yes. All right, so here's what I do want you to know. And I'm going to draw it up here. And you know, I know y'all love how I draw. So, okay. What is that? Uh, All right, so you have two upper chambers, don't you? Yes. And you have two lower chambers, don't you? Yes. But I need you to know that you have two pumps. It's not a pump. It is two pumps that must be working in complete synchrony. This right side of the heart is called the pulmonary circuit. Why do you think, where do you think blood is being pumped to from here? The lungs. You think so? Yes. You think that's why it's going to be called a pulmonary pump circuit? Because mm -hmm. from the right pump, blood is going to where? The lungs. What is the left pump? Where is that sitting in blood? You think so? Yeah. All right, you think the left side is sending blood to the body? Where in the body? All the Everywhere. Your toes, your fingertips, your hair follicles, everywhere. Your brain, your body organs, your joints, everywhere else. So let me ask you this. Do you all know already how blood comes to the, what type of vessels bring blood to the heart? Do you know what type of vessels bring blood to the heart? What they're called? They're called veins. Do y'all think they're called veins? Bring blood to the heart? And what kind of vessels carry blood away from the heart? Arteries. Arteries. You're right on that. But you're correct on that. That's true. But we're never thinking about the blood coming into the heart and somehow circulating in these four chambers. It doesn't. Sorry, I scared the cold. You don't. <laughs> it doesn't. Blood is coming to the heart, to the upper chambers. The upper chambers. And guess when the blood is coming into those two upper chambers? They're having to relax so they can what? Fill. They're having to be relaxed so they can fill with as much as they can get. Then when they contract, where are the upper chamber chambers sending blood to? The lower. The lower. So when these, these upper chambers contract, the lower chambers are relaxed so they can fill. Is that right? Then the lower chambers contract. Is that right? And the lower chambers send blood away from the heart. Are you all with me on that? So blood comes to the heart, to the upper chambers that are called the atria. Singular, they're called atrium. So there's a right, come on, come atrium. over here. Atrium. And there's a left, atrium. atrium. But when we're thinking about blood coming to the heart, where did they come to? The atria. atria. Is that right? Yes. Blood is entering the heart into the atria. And the atria are contracting, sending blood to the where? The ventricles, the bottom chambers are called ventricles. This is the right ventricle. And this is the ventricle. Why on a heart does this heart, why on this heart 
does this right side seem so much smaller than the left side? Why does it seem that way? Huh? Less muscle? Why? It's two pumps. Should the pumps be it doesn't have far to go Because this right side is only having to pump it to the lungs. So the lungs very far away. <laughs> no, actually, they're not very far away. So we don't want we don't want this to be too much bigger than this. But the left side is so muscular, so much muscle around that left ventricle because the ventricle sending blood away from the heart, right? Away into vessels called yeah. arteries, right? And this left, this are you telling me, are you telling me that when this left ventricle contracts, blood would have to be forced out high enough that it could get to our little toes? Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm here, Paul, are, really? Seriously? Yes. The left pump is called a systemic pump. Now let me ask you this, and just think about it for a second. Why must the two pumps be working in synchrony? So you can breathe in Why? What does that have to do with it? Why must they be working in synchrony? Because if they show up, the right of light. The quadrants. Why not? Because then we will have one muscle working more, causing atrophy to the other. Why would that happen? <laughs> where did you say the right side sending blood to? To the lungs. And where is blood going from the lungs? Where is it coming back to? To the heart. To the left side. Where did you say the left side was sending blood to? Right. To the system, and where is it coming back to? The right, the right side. Do you understand that if one pump is outpacing the other, then blood's going to be backing up in that other side? Do you get that? Do you get that? Yes. So if these two pumps aren't working in perfect synchrony, Blood will either be backing up in the lungs, or it will be backing up where? Your lungs. And the and the system, and if the system could be the, could be you know anywhere, it could be the lower extremities, but it could be anywhere, right? When we say blood is backing up into tissue spaces, we said it gives time for fluid to move into those tissue spaces, causing edema, which is defined as what? An excess of fluid in the tissue spaces, not just fluid in the tissue spaces, because they're supposed to be fluid. An excess of fluid in these tissue spaces. So do we want the heart working, the two pumps working in complete synchrony? Yes. Do we? Yes. Because we understand that if they're not, this is a closed vascular system to the lungs and to the system to the system and to the pulmonary circuit. Mm -hmm. So if it's a closed system, it means blood would either be backing up in the lungs or it's going to be backing up in the system. Mm -hmm. They better be working in complete synchrony. That means the atria fill at the same time and contract at the same time. When the atria contract, mm -hmm. y'all said that the ventricles have to be filling because atria sends blood down to those ventricles. Where do the ventricles send blood? Out of the heart. On the right side, the out of the heart is going to where? The lungs. <laughs> so, so let's just throw it away because you're not just keep picking it up. So it's going to the lungs. Now we understand that this right side is sending it to the right lungs through this, this, but also this is going to break and it go to the left lung. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So and this vessel would be called the left. This this chamber is the is the right ventricle, but this vessel is called an artery. Did, would it make sense to you that it's called a pulmonary artery? Would it make sense that it would be called that? You said this left ventricle is going to be sending blood. You said to the where? To the to the system, the entire system. So we know this vessel is an artery, don't we? Does anybody know what this artery is called? Aorta. It's the aorta or the aortic artery. That's exactly right. Are you with me on that? But you said blood is coming to the heart. It's coming to the heart by, what did you call them? You call these veins, didn't you? Now, if it's coming to the left side, where did you say blood had been? I'm sorry, I'm 
the if it's come, if they've been in the lungs. So these are called pulmonary veins. And if it's coming from the system, these, this, these veins are called the superior, and actually it's coming from lower body, inferior, vena cava. Vena cava is just a Latin way of saying what? Veins, these big veins. So do you get what I'm saying here? How many pumps? Is the blood a pump? It's a double pump. Two pumps. It just happens to be working in perfect synchrony. So when you're hearing the heart, how many people listen to hearts? You get to do it in lab Thursday. You're gonna listen to heart, each other's hearts. You're gonna take blood pressures. I know some of you are experts at it, so you'll help. <laughs> and let, you'll do people and you'll let people maybe do, okay? Um, okay, heart, heart beat, the sound. So what does a heart sound like? Blood so when we think about, what does it sound like? Blood See, they're my nurses that say love dough. A heart does not sound like love dough. A heart sounds like boom. But that's really hard to spell. And so what we do is we call it, in, in text, we call it love dough. If you all have heard the heart, have you heard the heart sound like boom? Boom. Doesn't it? All right, and it's doing that, and it's rhythmically doing that. That's it. It's two sounds. It's two distinct sounds. Boom, boom, boom. You've heard it, but you haven't. You're going to <laughs> now because I don't know how to spell that either. Let's let's just do like let's just do love up, love up, <coughs> love up, and it's very rhythmic, isn't it? Or should it be? Yes. Now, if it's not rhythmic, we're going to talk about that too. But let's right now think that we're talking about normal. So love up. Loved up, loved up. Where are those sounds coming from? The valves is going to the heart valve. The valves. What's, <laughs> What's a valve? What's a valve? Open to say valve. It's the doors. Yeah. It's oh, the doors between what? The between the. Oh, we color tents here. Uh, <laughs> So you're saying that there's these, there are these little doorways, mm -hmm. you're saying, between the atria and the ventricle? Yes. And then there's these little doorways, doorways between the ventricles and the arteries, is that what you mean? Yes. I don't know how we make these doors. There's a door. <laughs> there's a door. There's a door here. There are doors. So I want you to know that valves, valves act like doorways. They are, they are flats, they're flats, they are flats, okay? So what, it, what do you, what do you mean that you're hearing these valves? What kind of sound? The opening and closing? No. The blood that's rushing in? No. Is it just the closing? It's just the closing. Look, so when you're hearing love though, Love dub, love dub. Please listen to me instead of writing. You told me that these pumps are working in synchrony. The first sound, the first sound you're hearing are the closing of the A, B valves. That love, love is the closing, slamming shut of those valves. Why do they? Why are they called A B valves? Where are they found? Between the atrium and the ventricle. Between the atrium and the ventricles. Why is it just one sound? Because they're working in what? Secret. Look, shutting up those that valve. So where is the dub? The closing of the ventricles. These are clo the closing of that second set of valves. These are known as the semi-lunar valves. You know why they're called the semi-lunar valves? What does semi-lunar mean? And guess what? The, if you do a dissection in a certain way, guess what they look like? Really a quarter moon, but I guess that's harder to say. So they call them semi-lunar semi valves. Guess what? I would want you to know 
that on this side, this is actually called the what valve. This is the pulmonary artery that, it, that blood's being sent to. So this, this valve is called the what? Pulmonary. pulmonary valve. Guess what this valve is really called? Aortic, Aortic valve. But they collectively together are called the semilunar valves. So guys, y'all are telling me that the heart's a two pump system. Right pump, left pump. And you're telling me that the sounds, the love duck, the love duck, are the slamming shut, the first sound is the slamming shut of the AV valves, and the second sound is the slamming shut of the semilunar valves. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. You're only hearing it as, you know, this love, one, one sound for those two valves, and dove, another one sound for those semilunar valves. What's the function of them closing? So that they don't wax much. Because as blood comes into the heart and then exits the heart, do you want it going backwards? No. So what's the function of heart valves or any valves? What's the function of a valve? To, to, ensure, right. to okay. ensure one way flow or to prevent back flow. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. All right, guys. So what's what is it called, do you think? When you're listening to somebody's heart and you're hearing love go, love go, love go, but then you might hear it if you're listening carefully. And it's also why you're moving the stethoscope around. Why are you moving the stethoscope? Because how many valves do you really have to hear? Four. You're moving the stethoscope around to get a better view of the sound of a particular valve. But when you are listening and you hear instead of like love go, love go, you hear it love go. What is that referring to? What is that? What do you hear? You're hearing the backflow of of blood from a valve that closed, but then it prolapsed. Prolapse means that it went back, and blood is whistling backwards. It's whistling backwards. Does that sound like a good thing? No, because we want blood to be going in one direction, don't we? And that sound that a, a valve, a bulky valve, is creating when blood is back flowing is a murmur, a heart murmur. That's what that is. It's a heart murmur. If you heard love, the the the, the where is the murmur? Where is the which valve set of valves are you worried about? The A B valves. The A B valves. But if you hear love dubs, love dubs, love dubs, where is the problem? It's in one of the semilunar valves. So are you good? You said love sh dub. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. If the, if the whistle, if the whistle is after the first sound, then which valves are you concerned <laughs> about? The A B. If the whistling is after the second sound, which valves are you worried about? The semilunar semi valves. You good? Yes. Do I have any questions about this heart? Are you going to ever think about the heart as being an A pump again? No. Ray, Ray's like, no. Ray's like, no, I'm not. Because, Ray, you're going to think of it as a what? As a two pump system, understanding that blood is being pumped into vessels, vessels that are closed. Because if they weren't closed, you'd be bleeding out into your tissue spaces, right? The vessels are closed. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about a pump pumping <laughs> a substance into a vessel, it better have somewhere that it's going, mm -hmm. right? And since these two pumps, the, the right one pumping to the lungs, what's blood doing when it gets to the lungs? Getting oxygen. Yeah, it's dropping it's oxygen. Oxygen's diffusing across the blood. CO2 is being dropped off. And that blood's continuing to move. And it's moving to where? What a crazy looking diagram. <laughs> blood is moving to back to which side? The left, the left side. And then the left side's going to eventually pump it to the where? System. system. And what's it what's blood going to do when it gets to the system? No, but what's it going to what's going to happen? Drop off oxygen, all kinds of nutrients, all kinds of everything. Or, you know, it's, it's going to be giving stuff. Picking up CO2 and other and then coming back to what side? Right. So are you telling me, are you telling me then that the right venous return is just as important mm -hmm. as left? Mm -hmm. You are? You're saying that? Yes. Because we understand if there's a problem with left venous return, 
if there if there's a problem with this, then flu, then blood is going to stay in one of these systems too long. And when it's being backed up there, is it going to change how the tissues are functioning? Yeah, that's right. Yes, it is. So let, let me ask you this. And this is just something that you don't have to know this, you know, whatever. But let's see if you could just intuitively think about this. When someone has lung disease, which pump did we say is sending blood to the lungs? The pulmonary. The right pump, the pulmonary circuit pump. If somebody has like chronic lung disease, emphysema, or whatever, chronic lung disease, and the lungs aren't functioning the way that they should, and blood is backing up there, is, it, is this having to work harder? Yeah. Yes. And is this, if over time, can this muscle even hy become hypertrophic? What does hypertrophy mean? It's getting too large because it's working too hard. So we want to see hearts that look like this. We don't want to see hearts where the right side has worked so hard. Patients who've had chronic lung disease on their autopsies, their right side of their heart has had to work so hard that they have, they have hypertrophy of that right side. It's called core pulmonality. You get what I'm saying? Smokers have core pulmonality. They do. So, so anyway, that makes sense to us, though, because we know the heart is a what? Two pump system. And that it needs to be balanced, the blood moving. It needs to be not impaired in any of those systems because it's moving. Do y'all get it? It's moving like this. And it better not be stopping in one of them. All right, is that enough for today? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, bless your hearts if you did. Okay. I, I, uh, no, I'm talking about like business, right? Like you said. No. Yeah, no, your drawings will be illustrations. Your drawings will be illust. Hey guys, now when you're looking at this illustration though, and you see these, by the way, these these illustrations look flat. But is your heart flat? No, it is. It is no. Okay, look, and here's what I want you to see. Please, please pay attention to this, and I want y'all to put your hands on these real hearts Thursday. And your hands on these plastic hearts Thursday because it'll help you see this. You see this, you see this left atrium right here? And you see this right atrium right here? They look like they're far away from each other, don't they? Don't they look far away from each other? They're not. They're these little chambers that are kissing. They're sharing an inner wall. They're kissing. Please pay, please keep that in mind. You're looking at a flat picture. That can only be drawn in certain ways, but this this is a three-dimensional organ, right? So you've got so that's why you've got to pick up these organs. Look at them. Look at this. If you don't want to pick up a real heart, that's fine. But pick up the plastic ones, and, and please have an idea of how how this is working. You all will notice that I drew my arteries, the pulmonary artery and the aortic artery. I drew them down below, didn't I? Now I think this is one of the things that most confuses students when they're learning the heart. Actually, all the vessels are on the top, but I think it's hard for students to see blood coming into those atria. Atria sending blood to where? Ventricles. Ventricles contracting, and it looks like they're sending it back to the atria, but they're really not. They're sending it away. So I intentionally drew it just so you can visualize that, but actually in actuality are all of the vessels the, the veins bringing blood to the atria and the arteries taking blood away, are they all at the top? Yes. They are, and you have to really imagine the blood flowing. We'll start with that when we come back. All right, any questions for me? Y'all have a lot of lecture notes to review in the next couple of days, don't you? Um, 